I had an amazing haul of heirloom tomatoes this year, including Cherokee purple, pineapple, a zoichka, brandy wine, and lots more. And so many peppers. I tend to go a little overboard when starting seeds and planting, and I even gave away dozens of plants. Though the weather was crazy this year. First it was cool, then it was super hot, then we had flooding rains and weeks with no rain. I still had a bumper crop and I needed to get busy preserving them for the winter. Now one drawback with heirloom slicers is they have a tendency to split and bruise when we get heavy rains. This makes canning a bit challenging because you have to avoid those damaged pieces. Normally when canning, I plunge the tomatoes in boiling water, then into icy water, and this lets me remove the skins pretty easily. But when you have such a variety of shapes and sizes and bruises, that's not so easy with these big fruits. Now fortunately with the juicy tomatoes, the skins actually peel pretty easily when they are ripe. So I simply peel them by hand and then I cut away any damaged areas. I had plans to make salsa today and I don't like it to be too wet and so I like to remove the seeds and a little bit of the juices. But I always save the tomato water for future use. I've used it to make cocktails, soup, or just chill it and drink it. It's really good and I never waste it. Now I preserve tomatoes and peppers in many ways. I like to dehydrate them. Sometimes I use the pressure canner, but most typically with tomatoes, because they are acidic, I use the ball recipes. Sometimes I alter the recipe slightly to suit my taste, but it's always good practice to stick pretty close to the original recipes for safety reasons. We want to make sure whatever we're canning in a hot water bath canner is very acidic. And so you can use vinegar, citric acid, lemon juice. The recipes often give you alternative solutions. One thing for sure is we do not want botulism. Botulism is caused by Clostridium botulinum toxin. They live and grow in low oxygen or anaerobic conditions. Now the bacteria form protective spores when the environmental conditions for survival are poor, like not enough moisture or what have you. The spore has a hard protective coating that allows them to survive for years in challenging environments. Though the spores are pretty harmless, they can actually grow into active bacteria and begin to produce neurotoxins, which can cause paralysis and affect the central nervous system in many ways. Now the spores are often found on the surfaces of fruits and vegetables and in the soil. And since they grow best under low oxygen conditions, the toxin is most commonly formed when food is improperly processed at home. They can't grow below a pH of 4.6, so acidic foods such as most fruits and tomatoes, pickles, and things with vinegar can be safely processed in a water bath canner like I'm using today. But when foods have a higher pH, like green beans, meat, broth, those kind of things, they must be processed in a pressure canner which gets to temperatures high enough to destroy the spores. And what makes it really difficult is the food often doesn't look or smell bad, and so you can ingest these toxins without knowing it. For salsa, I like to dice the tomatoes into large chunks, and that way they don't cook down too much, and they stay a little chunky in the salsa. Would you look at this juicy rainbow? And that tomato water. And so I put them on the stove to heat up while I chopped all the peppers. Now I wasn't going for fiery salsa. I used mostly sweet peppers, but I also chopped up quite a few hot peppers and I try to wear gloves when I do that. I have burnt my skin and my eyes too many times to count. I just made sure that the final amount roughly matched the original recipe. And the same goes for onions. Now, garlic on the other hand, I tend to add quite a bit. I put copious amounts of garlic into this salsa, and I usually do. My crop was quite good this year. Now, spices don't really affect the safety of the product too much, just the flavor. And so for this batch, I used salt, Mexican oregano, and some chili powder. Now I used apple cider vinegar for this batch. You can use white vinegar, red wine vinegar. You can also use lemon juice or citric acid, depending on what you like and what you have on hand. And now again, for safety reasons, make sure to follow the guidelines in your recipe. 
Most vinegar comes in 5% acidity, but I have heard recently that many of the commercial vinegars have 4% this year. So be mindful of that when you choose your acid. After adding all the seasonings and letting it simmer a bit, I taste to be sure I like it and then adjust accordingly. Now the flavors and the heat level will intensify after the canning process. And so I try to keep that in mind. For hot processing, it's important to bring everything up to a rolling boil. And so while things are simmering, I like to heat up the water in the canner. Then I ladle everything into the jars using a wide mouth funnel. It's important not to fill the jars too much. We don't want anything escaping during the heating process. So I leave about a half inch headspace. And then I use a washcloth dipped in vinegar to wipe the rim. And that ensures that we get a good seal before adding the lids. Another thing I've learned is to buy good quality lids. I've bought some cheap inferior lids before that crack and buckle during the canning process. And then I simply add the bands and finger tighten. You don't want it too tight because steam is going to escape during that heating process. Then I use a jar lifter to place them gently in the canner and process according to the recipe instructions. These went for 20 minutes. Now it's also important to let them rest for just a bit before we take them out. When the jars are processed, the lid gasket softens and seals the surface, yet still allowing air to escape. The gasket then forms an airtight seal as the jar cools down. And this is crucial to create a vacuum, as a strong vacuum is essential to a good seal. And then the final most important step is to listen for the classic pop. And that lets you know that the seal has formed on the lids. It's also good practice to remove the bands before storing long term. If we leave the bands on there, sometimes it can hide the fact that we have a poor seal. And it just so happens I had a jar that did not seal very well. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can either try to reprocess it or simply refrigerate it and use it in the next week or so, which I did and it ended up in some really tasty chicken chili. It was absolutely delicious. And the last thing I do is to label each jar. That helps me to remember exactly what I've canned and it's also helpful when I'm giving them away as a gift, which I often do. I hope you enjoyed this video and watching my process. As always, I appreciate you and thanks for stopping by.